In this episode, we speak with Tal Tzvina Tanel, CEO and co-founder of Showfields, the pioneering next-generation brick-and-mortar retail store that was recently listed as one of the top young Israeli startups in New York by Forbes Israel. Tal is a serial entrepreneur and innovator at heart. He's co-founded several accomplished businesses, including Bluestone Group, which Live Nation acquired a majority stake in, and MyCheck, which was acquired by Shiji Group. Real Life Superpowers Tal, welcome to Real Life Superpowers. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure. Uh, first off, uh, congratulations uh, on your new venue in Miami, right? You've just signed the big deal? Yes. Uh, we just, uh, a few days ago, we announced uh, that we secured another location, uh, our second location in Miami, which uh, we are very, very excited about. Yeah. So maybe tell us a bit about what Chow Fields is. Wow. Wow. Um, So, I mean, long story short, I guess, uh, Showfield is uh, the most interesting store in the world. It's a place uh, that invites uh, customers to walk in, discover, engage, and shop brands and products they couldn't physically see and meet until today. We took upon ourselves a very big, uh, very big uh, task, and we are very much determined uh, to stand behind uh, that very big statement. And how is that different than, for example, you know, there is a sort of trend of uh, making stores super exciting and visual, like uh, I've just been to New York and I don't know, the Adidas concept store. It's awesome. So you're saying you're providing something that people haven't seen. Uh, how is it different? I think that in order to kind of understand maybe what Showfield is, uh, we should talk for a second about uh, the inspiration or, the, or like the origin story. Um, behind it, um, I, I think it's it's going to help, right? Perfect. So I was born and raised in Israel, which I'm sure you can kind of tell by by my accent, right? My, my mother was a, was a window dresser. My father was a diamond jeweler. I uh, grew up in a house where there was like design magazines and pictures my mom used to take from uh, storefronts. Uh, she kind of took from her journeys around the world. So kind of growing up, I always imagined this very magical universe of Um, and I was so excited uh, for the day that I would be able to kind of you know see more of the world and 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 you know and see all that magic which um, I was expecting uh, to see out there and then like a few years back uh, one of my previous companies uh, you know I had the fortune to relocate to to the US so I moved here uh, seven or eight years ago I guess um, and so I kind of landed in New York and Um, and you know I'm so so excited about all of those beautiful wonders that I'm about to see you know where is everything mm. um, I was uh, very surprised or I should say uh, uh, disappointed to see that uh, the streets of New York looks exactly like the streets of uh, Tel Aviv uh, maybe wider in some points and but you know it's it's, it's kind of dull it's boring and it pretty much looks like everywhere else around the world. So like the streets of Tel Aviv, the streets of London, the streets of Paris, Tokyo, like they all look the same. And none of them have what me or my friends kind of are, are after. Um, and they all look the same, right? So the first observation was this, you know, it was kind of, you know, I was a bit disappointed, but you know, it is what it is. And then a few years into it, I slowly discovered that, you know, my, my gut feeling was right. Meaning, The magic is out there. We, we live in a time where there's actually more brands, more products, there's more innovation than any other point in time in history, right? So if yeah. you think about the last decade, barriers of entry to creation were very, very you know, low, right? Between the we work of the world, to weeks, to building a website, to accepting payments, to strive to you know, ship drop, to manufacturing in China. Like, the, the ability for a person to take an idea, bring it to reality, Um, brought so much wonder to this universe um, that it's you know pretty magical so magic exists it just not exists where most people are meaning it's not in high street or in main street and that second observation is really what led to show right because we then ask how could it be that we live in the universe but there's so many beautiful things out there and yet it's so hard to find and 
the reason that I'm giving you this this kind of long spiel is because I think that what Shokut is trying to do in his essence um, is actually solve for a consumer problem. And that problem is what we refer to as a, as, as a discovery problem. Like discovery in the physical world is pretty much broken. Um, and Schofield started with the question of, of why is it so and how can we kind of solve for it? The first thing that we understood is that, you know, opening, and it's very intuitive, right? Like, like opening a physical store, online, like opening a store online is extremely hard. Opening a physical store is extremely hard, right? It requires time, skills, resources that kind of many, you know, that many, ma- most brands just don't have. But when you dive even deeper into it, you actually see that the problem is way more complex, meaning what makes it very, like, so hard for brands to go into the physical world, what makes it so hard for brands to open a physical store um, is actually, the I, I want to say, like, the, the, the combination of many, 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 many other sectors you know one of them is the is the, is the is like the resources and the, like the heart you know the, the 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 barriers that comes with the physical world but the bigger part of the picture is actually that what customers want today meeting the expectations of today's consumers and today's customers is really the hard part of that task so long story short i mean it's it's not a short anymore but long story short our vision was you know if we can simplify the process of opening a physical store, right? If we can make it easy uh, for a brand to open a physical experience, like a magical physical experience, the right type of physical experience, if we can make that process to be as easy as opening a website, we can make it then much easier for more brands um, to come to the physical world. And as a result, we can actually solve that consumer problem, which is discovered. So to put it into context, okay. So like, give me, give us an example of a, of a, of a, of a brand that you brought to the physical world and what kind of experience you have. I mean, I think like when, when you look at like this, you know, the, the new age of brands, which are out there, there's like a very exciting category, um, which called the uh, D2C, right. Direct to consumer brands. So this is a niche of brands who, um, grew online in the, in the last decade, right? So, you know, the the more, like the ones that like, uh, let's call it like the superstars of the category, everybody knows like Corby Parker and Casper and Roberts. But like we are talking of a, we are talking about a category of brands which actually has hundreds of thousands of brands, meaning there are hundreds of thousands of brands who grew online, digital brands. And, you know, it's very, very hard for today's customers to actually meet them in person. Right. So, we turned the process of opening a physical store for them to be, you know, streamlined as easy as opening like a website. And the way that we did it is by actually turning physical retail into a platform, which is both kind of physical and digital. The the, the end result is a store. It's a physical store, right? So our first location is is based in in, in New York, right? In in Eleven Bond, the corner of Bond and uh, Bond and Lafayette. And it's a physical store, four floors, 14,000 square foot space where customers can walk in and meet brands and customers in a way that they couldn't until today. A, because they never existed physically and B, because they are presented in a way which really kind of meets the expectations um, of today's customer. Like it's, it's done in a very kind of, uh, I want to say engaging and an immersive way um, which customers can really um, relate to, right? So, you know, examples can be, you know, from Quip Toothbrush, which is like the category leader in, in today's, I want to say, like a, a dental care, to like brands who just, who literally launched um, in, in the store today, to the city of Nashville, who opened the physical space. Like, when you think about physical retail served to you as a service or as a platform, but there's actually no limit um, to the amount of brands who who it's kind of relevant, I guess. Uh, I guess for. Do you feel that there's a change of incentive, like wh- an online store that's accessible globally? What's their incentive to opening up a physical shop? Yeah. So the biggest desire of a brand, um, the way that we perceive it, is the ability to tell their story. And I think that as time goes by, customers are 
and probably like even today more than any other time before, are very curious and are very eager to learn, to learn those stories and to get to know brands, right? So if you think about it that way, right, brands are basically an extension of our personality, right? And we want to get to know those brands and we want to understand where they come from. We want to understand what they stand for. Telling that story is a very, very, very complex task. It is correct that, you know, five or 10 years ago, being able to get in front of you online was something which was relatively doable. The thing is that in the last decade, the ability to get in front of you is actually becoming harder, harder, and harder. And today I want to say on border of almost like impossible, meaning what's called like when you look at the, you know, when you look at CAC, CAC meaning customer acquisition costs, right? Um, what it costs to get in front of a person today online, it's actually 4X um, what it used to be five years ago, right? Thing is that like we, all brands eventually want to be in front of customers. They all want to tell their story. The question is how to do so. So, if, you know, traditionally brands grew physically, right? And then online was the second layer. And then in the last decade, we have actually brands who grew online. So all brands want to meet customers and they want to better engage and, you know, kind of create this relationship. The thing is that like all brands just need more channels, um, more effective channels um, to tell their story and get in front of customers. So I don't necessarily think that it's, it's only about like an online brand needs a physical location as much as like all brands need a better way to tell their story. Right. Today, we actually work with brands which fall into four categories. Right. We have brands who just launched, which are emerging brands. We have brands who are like, you know, uh, VC back category leader, billion dollar companies who are just looking for another acquisition channel, another place to intersect with customers. We have brands which are platforms, right? Like uh, Amazon Music is one of our brands in the store today. We had uh, the city of Nashville a few months ago staying in the space. Um, inviting people to kind of get to know Nashville. And we had Shopify, the platform itself, taking half a floor and allowing, like, there's different types of motivations for different types of brands. And they all have the same kind of, you know, the same need. And that's how to better tell the story, how to better, you know, kind of how to get in front of customers in a more meaningful way. And I just think that physical is just a very good channel um, to do so. But like the World Wide Web is pretty much open to the universe. And then to discover a brand in Showfields, uh, a person has to be walking down Bond Street. So how do you overcome that? Isn't the combination like the magic sauce here? Yeah. So let's go back to the beginning of the Internet for a second. OK, so like 15 years ago, 10, 10 15 years ago, you know, um, the Web is, is, is this thing. Um, brand understand that they need to get on board. And they're just not sure what, right? So they're facing with a decision, you know, should we just, you know, kind of build a website? Should we, back then, by the way, was hundreds of thousands of dollars or like could have been like a million dollars to open a website. Um, should we take an agency? Should we build a team in-house? Or, you know, what it is that we need to do? They all know that they need to get on board. And then eventually, like what we see is that there's like this new rise of categories like Quicks, like Squarespace, like, um, you know, like GoDaddy, who basically just made the process very easy and enabled brands to do so. And then the years goes by, and then all of those brands who traditionally just had a website, which was more of a storytelling medium, right? You remember the first website, um, just like get to know us and, and nothing else. All of those brands understood, oh, wait, this customer actually has a buying power. They actually want to transact. And then again, they were facing with the decision, should we, you know, build a team in-house? Should we add e-commerce? Should we, you know, like take an agency and build like this uh, uh, e-commerce platform within our website? And then again, by the way, the trend that we see is that like we had a company like Magento, like Shopify, like WooCommerce, who came into the world and just made this process very, very relatively easy for brands to get on board and allowing them to focus on what it is that we do. We believe that we are in the exact same point in time, just when it comes to physical, meaning all brands, they understand that they need to have a physical touch point. They need a physical touch point, not instead of their online, but as another mean of communication with the customer. It's another way 
to get in front of the customer. The problem that doing so, as I said, is extremely, extremely, extremely hard. You know, Shopee today has one store. In a few months, you're going to have two stores. But the point is that like in five years from now, you're going to have a Shopee in every tier one city around the world. Oh, is and the model uh, that a brand that is in one location going to be uh, in all locations? So the ability, if you want to jump to the future for a second, right? The okay. ability is like the goal is for a brand to have the ability to go into the Shopee's platform and basically deploy physical presence worldwide in the same ease they open a website. So you can come to Shopee and say, I want to have 20 stores tomorrow, like in a month from now in Tokyo. I want to have a store in Paris. I want to have a store in Milan. I want to have a store in LA and I have a store in Tel Aviv. To see how that store performs in those markets for a few months, then to choose what market they want to focus on and have a physical presence permanent. either in showfield or with our own store using our tools or even without our tools it doesn't matter the ability to think about physical in the same way you think about digital is really kind of what I think interesting here and yes showfield has one store and you when you walk in that store from a consumer perspective you just walk in and you say oh my god beautiful I mean I hope that that's kind of what people say but like for for a customer perspective it's just a very interesting store but like our plan here is you know really you Kind of thinking about retail as a platform and making it more accessible every day for more brands and more customers and how did you decide like to extrapolate that to Miami like why Miami like our mission as a company is to create a better way for customers and for brands um, to engage um, and in order to do so we need to be in a place where customers are and in a place where brands kind of want to be right and So we looked into a few markets, you know, from LA to, to Chicago. We looked at Boston. We looked at Texas. We looked at, you know, you know the, the tier one cities in, in, in the U.S. Um, and we were looking for the intersection of places which are, um, have high food traffic. There's the right, right relationship between local tourists um, to like, in, like from locals to tourists. And then the breakdown between in domestic tourism and international tourism. And a place which is considered like cool and has some cachet, and just like all of those things intersect, I want to say very early in Miami. But you know, I can tell you that next on our list are every other city that you can imagine in the u s and also you know obviously in Europe, right? Um, Shopee is again is, is is a store, but it's really it's more of a stage, right? So we are there to stay, but everything within those spaces con- in the, within our spaces constantly kind of changes. And that's kind of what you know makes it I want to say very um, very interesting and and tell me something if I take the um, the model of having a commercial let's say uh, shopping mall okay so usually uh, how mm-hmm. they uh, develop that is they have like an anchor base meaning let's say I'll give you an example you have a Walmart that brings in a lot of traffic and around that you build any other brand okay so there's what's called an anchor brand okay on the online world mm-hmm. because they don't have physical traffic, What like for you is an anchor brand that you have to have on your areas to bring in traffic? Yeah, so that's why when we look at locations at least like in the next you know at least in the last year and maybe in the next in the next in the year to come, uh, we are focused in tier one cities tier one locations. so like we take prime 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 real estate, which means it's a place which already has a lot of baked in food traffic, right? But when you think about the experience that we are creating, um, we actually like our strategy is actually to infuse those spaces with a lot of content so if traditional by the way you know as you said like uh, uh retailers right when you think about like shopping malls their anchors is usually a specific tenant our anchor tenant is curiosity it's the fact that you never know what it is that you are going to see so turning retail into a physical platform means that brands can come and And in a very easy way, have a physical store, right? So let's say you're a brand, you're invited to show up. You go into a process. By the way, 85% of that process is online. So you basically do next, 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 things with your website. And we then turn your website into a physical, physical store where right. our team design, build, staff, we do everything. This ability makes it very easy for brands to open a store. What we do is that every few months, we actually change all the spaces in the store. The result is that from a customer perspective, every time you come to show up and you see brands and you know art 
and experiences and products that you didn't see before. So the reason that people today come into the store and that every week, every month, we see more people and more returning customers, and most people who come in eventually tell their friends, oh my God, you have to check that place, is because they've seen, like, we, you know, they are able to access beautiful things that they, you know, they drive value to them, things that they couldn't right. see, things that get them excited. Um, and that's kind of our, our anchor. And, you know, I think that's, by the way, like one of many other things that traditional retail kind of looks like, and we really try to rethink. Um, so Anchor Tenant is one of them, but like the list goes on and on and on and on. Like what I really like about our journey is that we actually allowed ourselves to rethink how a shopping experience would look like from the perspective of the customer. Well, traditional retailer, when traditional multi-brand environment, when traditional shopping malls, shopping centers um, are pretty much running all in the same way, which is there is the landlord model. There is a landlord who is making money from brands um, and their sales and their ability to make revenue in those places, um, which kind of forced them to say, what are the brands that for sure are going to sell? What are the brands that want to drive the, the highest amount of revenue for us? we had the ability to ask, how can we create a model where customers would always be happy? How can we serve customers' brands in a better way? How can we make it easier to shop? How can we make it more interesting? How can we make retail about them and about the brands and not about us, which is the hosting, um, the hosting brand? Um, and it seems to be kind of working so far, which is something which you know makes us I guess very happy because obviously coming into it, there was a lot of questions, mark, question marks. Um, and yeah, it's, a, it's, it's been a very interesting journey so far. Yeah. So speaking about journeys, and I will want to also tap into all those initial questions uh, that you had, because uh, I mean, it makes uh, all the sense in the world that uh, the clarity that you now have wasn't something that was there from the get go. But let's take a little bit of a step back and talk about your personal journey. So, like, did you ever work for anybody? You're a serial entrepreneur, but, like, how did it all start? So, I ne I've never worked for necessarily anyone, but, like, it's also a complex statement, right? So, like, I always worked in companies which I founded, right? I was, uh, uh, my first uh, gig, I was not, like, my first startup, I was not the CEO. Um, but, um, yeah, so I kind of always worked for companies that, that I founded, I uh, I, I don't like this world of serial and not entrepreneur. I think that in my head, it sounds like something more like a serial killer than, mm -hmm. than anything else. Um, I look at it as, as myself, at least, more like, a, you know, it's not a common word to use today, but more as, a, as an inventor um, than, uh, than, than anything else, right? But yeah, I mean, from, you know, since I was kind of a child, I guess, um, to my first company, which I founded... Uh, when I was uh, 21, uh, first year of, uh, of college. Um, there were all companies that I was one of the co-founders of. And yeah, it was always a crazy, crazy journey. What did you study in college? So I studied in the IDC uh, in the international program of Rekanati International School. And this was, I guess, like the first, uh, this led to the first startup. I've, uh, um, you know, it, it started as like a, like this social media that uh, site that was supposed to connect between, you know, tourists coming to Israel. It was called like the Israeli Connection, and then it turned into like this uh, a site about helping people together better know kind of Israel. Um, we started doing an event, like events, and then eventually we uh, we opened an event production company. Um, which by the way, like Quint Years became one of the biggest event production companies in Israel. This is Bluestone. Yes. So Bluestone is uh, is that company. I was you know uh, I was in charge of the creative in the first years of the company. This was a very kind of fun journey. And you know when I'm thinking today about what tools do I have in order to dare to try and build like the most interesting store in the world, I actually think that you know physical events like physical event productions is a very big part of it, right? And this was a very interesting part of the journey. Yeah, I mean during those uh, years to follow. I also co-founded another company called MyCheck. Uh, this is where 
uh, we met uh, many parts. Correct. Time. You're, you're allowed to get. Uh, you're, you're allowed to say that we had we made the advertisement where I played in an advertisement of his. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like uh, we we we've launched a, a company called MyChip, which does mobile payments. We started as a consumer app. So basically, a customer can go into a bar, a restaurant, see the check running on their phone, and kind of check out like they own the place. Our our you know motto back then uh, was kind of our tagline was check out like a rock star. Um, we did a series of fun uh, you know fun like commercials, and then he was actually the star of those. Uh, until I those, uh, until I I, I said no ads. for the negotiations, and then you took like someone called Barafelli. She was like, uh, yeah, she went a lot so, smaller. I mean, you know, me. yeah. So like, Manny Paz was the first, uh, the first star, and he, you know, he was kind of the main. Uh, he was the rock star in our first ads, and then you know, after Manny Paz, we we said, you know, who can top that? Because it's really hard, you know, because he's really good. And then we decided to basically go with Barra Farelli, which was the second best thing after him, um, and. Uh, and yeah, and uh, many, and you know, Barf Ali uh, did another ad with us, which eventually kind of got a lot of attention. Yeah, so it was a very fun, very fun time. Also, like a lot of you know uh, lessons uh, from from that from that from that part of the journey. Right, we started as a consumer app. Building a consumer product in Israel is one thing. Building a consumer product in the U.S. is a completely different thing. So there's a lot of good learning there. I have to say something. Like something is really interesting in the story. You're going through it really fast, but there's two things that I noticed. Like uh, now that you said it, like we, we know before, but there's something that you said that goes like it, you just see it's reoccurring. So there's two things you said. You don't like the serial entrepreneur, which I understand why not because something's uh, really interesting is that in your whole story, I find you pivoting a lot meaning you're taking momentum from one thing and then pivoting to another product and another product, another product. So it's actually, it starts from one adventure and it just materializes into other things while you're doing it. Right. So I feel like that's something that, that, that you've done a few times, like till Bluestone, like there was a few pivots on the way. And even when we were talking about my check, like the other thing is that all of the things that you did, in, uh, in your life, they're also physical and also online. Like you're never just just the online or offline person, right? Am I correct? Correct. When you look at the nature of like of starting a business, right? So businesses always start all products, right? It's not business. Like a, a business is a way to monetize um, from a product, and a product is always an answer to a question, or should I say, a solution to a problem. Hmm. So. When we started um, our, my first, like, you know, the, the first startup, which eventually the problem was how can we create a better way for, you know, like for customers, like for, for tourists coming to Israel to event. And then we saw, so this was the pain point, right? And then we saw that, um, you know, producing those events in a certain way, in a certain standard was where we actually see a lot of traction and where we can bring the highest value. So then... We knew what it is that we need to do. And from that point in time, you know, the company kind of grew. It just became bigger and bigger and bigger and better than what it is that, that it does, right? So this is kind of chapter one, and this is the event. And then you look at chapter two, which is mobile payments, right? My check. My check started with a problem. The problem was that consumer paying experience is broken. It doesn't make sense that you stand in a restaurant, you wait, it's annoying, it's awkward. There's a lot of social awkwardness when you want to, you know, pay the check in a restaurant. You pay for this, you pay for that. Like, there's a lot of pain points. So again, we started with a consumer problem. The problem was that like this process is not effective. It can do better, and by doing so, the benefit, like the restaurant, the hospitality venue, and the customer would win. Mm -hmm. We started with a consumer app, but we then understood that in order to have our solution serve more and more and more customers and in a better way, we actually need to pivot to a B2B model. Meaning instead of saying it's about us, instead of creating a consumer app called MyCheck and thinking the whole world is going to use MyCheck, we said, you know what? There's so many beautiful brands out there, right? Let's just give them the tools. So instead of creating a MyCheck app, let's give uh, mobile payment abilities to WeWork which was one of our first customers. Let's power the cheesecake factory and give them the tools, right? So, you know, while there is pivots, because there always are, I think it's always started with a consumer problem 
that we are trying to solve. And mm-hmm. I think that the journey that, the, you know, and you know that as, as an entrepreneur as well, right? That, that it's, it always starts with the pain point. The question is like, where is the right, you know, w- what is the best angle or what is the best way to solve for it? Yeah. And the journey of finding it usually where, you know, that's usually the hard part that nobody likes to talk about, right? Because it's literally what you think it's going to be. And that's exactly what I think uh, I'm hearing from you, because I think that um, what you're describing, those pivots, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't, didn't they always happen at an intersection where there was a problem in the business? Because, you know, pivots don't just happen when everything goes fine. And then, you know, an entrepreneur has a, a choice to make. It's either let's just stop and, and give up or let's reimagine and, and, you know, reinvent ourselves. And it sounds like you were always able to st- take a step back, reinvent yourself and then get back to the court. Am I right? I mean, yes and no. I mean, I, I, see, I wish things were so simple. But the reality of a founder is that things are way, 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 way more complex, right? It's not that like you are on your journey and then you see a red light. So now you know there is a problem and now we need to go into a room and find a solution and then we pivot. It doesn't work that way because the reality is that the day-to-day of, of, of any startup is, is, you know, it's hard. And like the day-to-day, like I always think, you know, when every time I interview a new team member or every time I kind of talk in front of a group about startups, I always describe that startup is like being on a roller coaster, right? You're up, you're down. Most of the time you want to vomit, mm-hmm. right? But the point is that, like, you know, if you don't feel that way, it only means that you're not moving fast enough or that you're not moving at all. So that's kind of the, you know, that's kind of the, the, the day-to-day situation. So my point is that, like, when you are starting a business, it constantly feels that way. So it's not necessarily that you know, oh, my God, now there's a problem we need to solve it. I think that, you know, it's, it's more about constantly trying to feel where you drive more value and not necessarily the skies are falling, let's solve a solution. Like, it's not that the business model that we had, like, in the first company, like, okay, it's broken, let's get into a room, let's start doing events. We did few things, and then we saw this part works the best, let's focus on that. And when you look at the core of MyCheck, MyCheck has a very unique technology that allows point of sale, that allows mobile payment using point of sale integration. This is the core. The question that we, like our mission was to bring that solution to as many people as possible. What we asked ourselves, what is the most, you know, effective way to do so? And eventually we decided to go on B2B. But it's not because one day, like, you know, it was like, okay, X, this doesn't work. Let's do this now. And by the way, I'm not saying it because I think that, like, we did something good. I'm saying it because like, I wish that this is how it, how it was. But the reality is that most of the time you don't have such a clear answer. And it's really about trusting your gut feeling kind of, you know, and, and trying to work in a very methodological way, building a thesis, deploying like this, 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 this experiment, building a feedback loop to see what works, what doesn't, and then just trying to double down on what it is that works more. It's rarely like, okay, this doesn't work next. So yes, to your question, I think like there's a lot of pivots. But I feel like pivot, again, like for me, is like something which comes with a negative, right? Where in reality, I think that everything that we do is about transformation and it's about growth. The question is, where do you want to grow? Yeah, where the compass is uh, now pointing. And I, exactly. it seems like since you're 21, you have a constant uh, feeling of nausea in your, in your <laughs> stomach. Is that something that gets easier? Um, well, no, I wish it was. Um, I mean, you know, so it's like, it's, it's yes or no, right? So like, If, because it's all, you know, there's another layer to it and it's like the levels of intensity, right? So the feeling is the exact same feeling. It's ups and downs and, you know, your stomach is, is like, you know, with a very weird feeling. But like, if you take the ups and downs that I had in my first business compared to the ups and downs of a company who raised $6 million to a company who raised $20 million to a company who needs to have physical locations, like, So it's like from, from going to a basic like Luna Park type of roller coaster, maybe today I'm just like in a sixth leg type of a roller coaster, right? So yes, you develop a stomach to, you know, to a certain type of a feeling, but also the level goes up. And now like there's, you know, there's loops and there's twists and it's like the roller coaster goes into water, right? 
So like, you know. Um, but you have more skills. You have more skills, but the minute you have more skills, like you want to go next and just build a bigger roller coaster. Right. There you go. That that's the question, yeah. Tal. I'm gonna let's let's try to speak here as as straightforward as uh, as possible. Okay. This is my theory. A lot of uh, people who are who are entrepreneurs, they want to like. It's not that you can uh, not stop uh, vomiting or getting to higher peaks. It's something in you saying, "Okay, I can build this roller coaster higher." I can twist it more. Let's see if this velocity works. Like, are you putting yourself in uncomfortable modes to get the best out of yourself? Or is it actually the business mm-hmm. just pulling you there? Yeah. You know, I think that like as an entrepreneur and as human, we always kind of want to grow. Right. And I think that growth can only happen in the end of your comfort zone. And like, even though what I'm saying sounds like spiritual, it's actually the same as your business. So when you are a company in a growth stage, then you constantly need to try to push past the point of where you're doing well right now. So your business, there's things which are working for you and they're great. But whatever it is that, so now it's great. So now like pressure level is a bit lower. But now that you see what it is that is great, now you say, okay, I want to double down on it. And then again, it becomes harder. And then you need to grow. You need to hire. You need more people. You need a different set of skills. The the nature of, of growth is always in the end of your comfort zone. And same goes to that feeling, you know, the metaphor we were talking about when it comes to like a roller coaster, right? Um, I don't think it's like a conscious decision as much as like people who put themselves in those situations just feel like it's, you know, it's, it's like the reason that they begin with like this business is because, you know, like the compass pointed in a certain way and they have this vision to solve this very big problem just in a very bigger scale. Um, and you know, it's kind of getting there requires that constant, you know, uh, uh, increasing in the levels of everything that you do. And as a result, that feeling, I guess. I love it that you're using the word need and not want because you, you want to grow, but you need to grow. You know what I mean? Like, like, I'm not saying this in actually a bad way, because I think this is like a winner state of mind. Okay. This is like the people you want to work with. They always need to get the next level. Like, I'm not sure. I don't know but I'm not sure you needed to each time challenge the next step. Like you maybe wanted it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, let me give you like another, you know, we are very metaphorical today. So let me give you a small metaphor, right? Um, So when you're going to the gym and you want to build a muscle in your hand, right? Then you basically take, you know, you take a weight and you start doing 10, right? And then after a month, 10 is already, so in the beginning, it's very painful, right? Your your muscle kind of uh, shrinks and and uh, and then like you feel this pain. And then after doing it one week, two weeks, three weeks, suddenly when you do it, you don't feel that pain anymore. So you now need to either do more or just increase the weight. So muscle always is built from restriction, like always built from you applying more resistance to that part. So I'm not saying that the founder is necessarily after pain, but a founder is after building the biggest muscle possible. But in that case, the muscle is the business. So if your goal is to grow the business, because the business, because by growing the business, it means that your solution can actually serve more people and more customers. And as a result, kind of, you know, do better, then you want to build a bigger business. And as a result, you constantly need to build that muscle. You know, like a funny kind of quote that I really like. Someone once asked uh, Muhammad Ali, how many push-ups does he do? And he said, I'm doing 10 after I cannot do any more. Meaning I, do, I never count them. But the minute I feel I cannot do any more, I'm doing 10 more. And I think that that's the state of mind of, of an entrepreneur, of any business with a mission to grow. I agree so much. Like I practice martial arts and I can add to what you're saying that you practice and sort of your brain and your body is making connections and you're learning. And through the practice, you're improving. And then what used to be impossible becomes just, uh, you know, setting the stage for the next level. So, you know, with respect to entrepreneurship, I feel like every experience that you gain, your brain is making all these connections. And now you're at a level where you're ready for the next steps because your previous experience is preparing you for what's next. And you're now ready to do bigger, bigger things. A hundred percent. You know, like I'm looking at like the last part of the journey. 
which is Showfield, right? So a few years, like two years back, I'm, I'm fundraising. And, you, you know, basically you have a group of, uh, of entrepreneurs who say, uh, you know, back then skies are falling. People saying that retail is dead. There is retail apocalypse. And there's a group of crazy kids who come and say, you know what? We want to build a department store, right? I mean, it's not a department store, but let's call it like in the scale of a department store in the middle of New York. A group of kids who never had retail. And it sounds a bit crazy, right? Like, why? Like, why building a store? Why retail? Like, everybody's running away, you running into the fire. And like, what makes you feel that you can do that? And a very big, you know, kind of, you know, I, I want to say a motif that, like our team has, and it's a very big part of our day to day, kind of tapping into what it is that you just say is actually making the impossible possible. And I think that, you know, the part that I like the most, what drives me as, as an entrepreneur is really that part and nothing else. The part of creation, the part of making something that is impossible today possible. But because by, by doing so, like you can actually unlock a lot of opportunities for many people who until today didn't think it is. And I think that as a result, there is a lot of value that is always kind of being driven, right? So in the beginning, it was like, can you build a store? Like, why would you build a place that, you know, people would want to come into? Why would you want to build a place that people would come and say, you know, it's so nice and we want to take pictures? So today, after we had hundreds of thousands of people in the space, after we had millions of impressions, after we had like, you know, um, um, such a very like knock and wood great success there, people are like, okay, but why do you think you can open two of those? And then why do you think you can open 20 of those? So it's always about kind of what is what is next and what's impossible right now. And that's like, at least for me, like the favorite part. So, you know, going back to our roller coaster, um, building one store today doesn't give me, you know, uh, uh, nausea, right? But like, Maybe building five does, and after five, it's building twenty, and to, the, the day it, and then after it can be something else, right? But I think that like as humans, um, life is really about kind of transforming and, and growing, and and that's kind of what that's what you know that's what's so interesting about our journey here. Tell me something. Right now, you started off as a business that's running towards the fire, meaning uh, everybody was trying to get away from retail. You were looking to get in. Now, I'm wondering for all these entrepreneurs that are listening, what would be your advice to people who have great ideas, but they're against trends? Okay, so you're trying to pitch something where with the statement of investor would say, listen, um, retails down. Like, why do you think this is a good time to do it? So when you have that kind of a challenge, what would you say entrepreneurs should think of or get ready for when they meet investors? I guess like my end, like it, it's twofold, right? First of all, the fact that no one is going there doesn't mean that you need to go, right? But the reality is, is that when no one else is there, there is an opportunity, right? But it doesn't mean that if no one is going into some direction and there is a fire there, it doesn't mean that you need to run in. But statistically, going to places where no one is or against trend actually, you know, would have a lot of benefit. Um, the good thing is that if you are successful, then, you know, like you are first mover and you kind of, you know, there's a lot of benefits to it. I think that we ran into a fire because we didn't see a fire. And I think that that's my message here, right? right. People said that retail is dying um, and they ran away. We actually think that there wasn't, like the problem was not retail. The problem was that what customers are looking for doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. And in that universe, what people think is apocalypse and is bad for us was actually an opportunity. So if you think about our strategy, we thought that the customer experience is broken, meaning customers today have different expectations from everything, from shopping, from, from, from discovery, from engaging, from talking. To, like, there is a different expectation and it's very hard to meet that expectation. There is a different product which is needed uh, when it comes to physical shopping. And we thought that we know how to solve for it and how to give a solution that they would want. That was our season. And then in that universe, we need a physical space. Then for us, the fact that the skies were falling was actually good. It became an opportunity because we were able to secure like a building in Soho, which like, I don't know if like three years ago we could have, 
like I, who would have speaking to us, right? Like it's it's a building that H&M or Zara uh, would go after. And suddenly a group of like young entrepreneurs um, actually are able to secure that building in a price and in a deal that like historically was never done before. So like <clears throat> skies are falling for some people, but for us, it was like the best thing that could have happened. Right, right. But I just want to say that like, you know, I think we were lucky on that perspective, but also that it's, it's, and it's an important point to stress that we didn't, uh, the discussion didn't started with, you know, and, and, and it's a good, like, and you can do that. I'm not saying you can't, but the discussion didn't started with, okay, retail is having a problem right now. Like, what can we do about it? Right. Right. The discussion started with, we actually think that there's a consumer problem. How can we solve for it? And then it went through physical, you know, it went through kind of physical retail. The only thing I will say is that it requires a very strong stomach to go on that path. You know, fundraising, every time you invent a new product or a new category, um, it's hard because, you know, people like to put things in boxes. And when you want to invent your own box, there is really no box to put you in. Right. You know, and that's always hard. So you just need to be, you know, twice as persistent and, uh, and uh, determined and... Uh, and literally think uh, and out of all. the box. <laughs> yeah. Like I remember the first disaster meeting that we had. So it was like, oh, so you're doing, uh, we work for retail. Oh, so you're doing uh, Shopify for physical. Oh, so, like people, like we tend to put things in boxes. So we kind of need to define things with other things that we know. Um, and I think that every time you try to do something which is new, it's okay. very hard. Exactly. But the good thing is that if you are able to do that, then suddenly people... Now they, say, they will say, <laughs> Showfield, you're doing Showfield. Exactly. And I always told like investors, no, we're actually doing Showfield for, for Showfield. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, and, and that's all. And they would look at me, oh, what do you mean? But like, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this is how we looked at it uh, to begin with. And yeah, wow, it's, uh, it's a crazy, crazy journey. I really, I really recommend uh, people listening. If you're hanging out uh, in New York City, go to Bond Street, check out Showfields. You'll thank us. And so, Tal, let us yeah. ask you something uh, that we always ask. Uh, what's your superpower? What's my superpower? Um, I don't know if I have a superpower. I think that, like, um, maybe, I don't know how to define it, right? But, like, I think that something that um, that I'm doing, I think okay with is being able to see something in my head, like have this vision and being able to bring it to reality. Um, I think that there's like a lot of people who are very kind of good in, in driving a vision and they're, you know, very, and there's a lot of people who are very good in like kind of, um, you know, and, and building stuff. I think the ability to taking something from zero to one at least it's something that I'm very, you know, that I feel comfortable with. Like I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that feeling. And you're experienced with um, it. You've done it. Yeah. But you know what, actually, I think that, I think that if I have a superpower, it's just, it's that I don't, I don't give up. That's all, which is a good and a bad thing, but I just, you know, I don't, uh, I don't give up. I feel like, uh, you know, there is a, I'm, I'm giving you a motivational quotes today. So I'll give you another one. But like there was an interview with Will Smith when someone asked him, like, what is his superpower? And he said that, like, if you and me are both on a treadmill, I am not the fastest person. I'm not the strongest person. But I can tell you that I would die and I would not get out of the treadmill before you. <laughs> I think that that's a very good, you know, quality that a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs have. And that's just the ability not to give up. It doesn't mean that you have to be the best, but you just need to stay one second more. You have to be more, you have to be able to endure more than others. And to endure and keep on pushing. As long as you're loyal to the question that you're initially asking and you still believe that there is a solution for it, then not give up. Sometimes, by the way, the question that you started with, you see that you were wrong. Like the answer that you thought is the answer is not correct. And then like actually knowing where to stop is important. But I think that, you know, as long as you believe in that, that you still, you know, that if you believe in your solution, then see another day. And your kryptonite? I hope it's not your stomach. <laughs> no, no. Uh, there is a anti-acid pill for that. 
No, I'm joking. Um, but like, um, I think that my kryptonite is is time. I always feel like I have no time. I always feel like I'm in a race against time and like the most precious thing in life. And, you know, is time. And like when you are kind of grinding and with a startup, you feel like time is flying away all the time. And I feel like, you know, perception of time is my kryptonite. Hmm. And um, and, uh, and the reason, by the way, it's, it's kind of kryptonite is because it's really the perception of time because sometimes you just need to be more patient and that's the right thing to do. And sometimes you just need to kind of pull through. Um, so I would say that my the perception of time is my kryptonite. That's interesting. Uh, we want to be respectful of your time. So we won't hold you much longer. Just uh, want to ask you, what can we wish you? What can we wish you on Showfields? Where do you see this heading? Our goal is just to allow more customers to meet more brands. And, um, you know, if it's with the solution that we have today, if it's with, um, you know, if it's with a different or improved solution, but that's kind of where we are after, right? I, I truly believe that we, We live in a very unique point in time and, you know, there is so much magic out there and it was never harder to find. And, uh, you know, people think that in the age of the internet, like it's very easy because you can find everything online, but they don't understand that we are always limited to what it is that we know. So while search is optimized, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So the only thing you can wish for me is that we will get to see and get to help more customers meet more brands um, in a more uh, meaningful uh, way for both of them. Amazing. So I, I'm, by the way, so, so I wish you the best on luck in that. And on, in June, I'll meet you there. So I want to see what's going on. I'll be there in the beginning of June. Perfect. Um, I'm looking forward to showing you the space. And um, again, I just, you know, I'm, I'm very appreciative of uh, every opportunity to share about showfield and about what it is that we do. So I'm grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. We're so much grateful too. It's, this was a pleasure. So bye for now. Bye bye. Real life. Super powers. Superpowers.